All right, well, we'll move on. And uh, Len Richter, and I, I introduced Len er, earlier, but uh, Len's the founder of the company uh, back in 1985. And he's been working on special projects the last few years since he retired. And one of his special projects is his uh, Knox Analyzer Converter Efficiency Tester, which is required in some parts of the country and not required in other parts of the country. And it's a little black box, <laughs> pun intended. Uh, and it's uh, it's over here on the table, so when we have to take a break uh, in a little bit, uh, I'm sure I'll stick around and show you around and uh, use the converter efficiency tester, so uh, you can talk about it. Just to kind of follow up on the uh, previous presentation, people kind of forget that in system name is the word custom. So we can do most anything in a custom manner. We're not a large manufacturer that makes hundreds of something and try to sell it. Okay. We have our own fab shop, welding shop if you want to call it that. So like I say, if you've got a special need, sketch it out, and we'll give you a cost. Okay. Um, I see we've got some SIMS technicians in the room here, uh, as well as some DHS people. Uh, so I'm going to bore the SIMS technicians for the next five minutes or so. But I have to get some background uh, on this here. Um, the analyzers that we work with in the SIMS field are molecule counters. There's no such thing as a Knox molecule. Mother Nature will kind of give you a strange look if you ask for a Knox molecule. Knox is the name to be given to the foundation of the NO nitrogen oxide and the NO2 molecule, nitrogen dioxide molecule. Okay? Um, clicker. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. There you go. Here we go. So in the United States, the accepted technology for the measurement of Knox is a chemical resistance technology. Um, but it only detects the NO molecule, and it detects chemical light given off in the NO molecule settles down to its steady state in O2 exposed to the ozone. Okay. So basically the chemiluminescence NOx analyzer is in reality an NO analyzer. It does not see the NO2 molecule. Okay. Uh, so to capture the NO2 in the sample, because we have both NOx and NO2 in most of the combustion of two gases. Uh, there's an NO2 to NO converter and in the chemiluminescent sample that should be built right into the analyzer. Uh, there are external NO2 to NO converters you can add to say an IR analyzer if you want this is uh, Europe's um, accepted technology but not ours. Uh, therefore, we can say we have a NOx analyzer. Let's understand that all we're looking at is the NO molecule, but the analyzer converts the NO2 to NO for the sample reaches the detector. Uh, so the efficiency of the NO2 to NO converter directly affects three point NOx value. That's to be assumed, okay? And the SIMS regulations do require a minimum of 90% efficiency. And this requires testing the efficiency of the converter periodically to verify this efficiency. Okay. Uh, there are basically two types of NO2 to NO converters that are used in the chemiluminescence and NOx analyzers. Uh, one type is catalyst. You know, this catalyst will lose efficiency over time as the catalyst is used up. 
they're actually graded in molecules per time. In other words, the, uh, you're graded, which is a very low number, say a thousand um, ppm hours. You can convert one ppm for a thousand hours, or you can convert 10 ppm for a hundred hours. Right? So these catalysts will eventually deteriorate and um, need to have either the catalyst replaced or most catalysts nowadays you replace the whole assembly. It's needed. The other type is a stainless steel, and this is the first type that was used in chemiluminescence analyzers. Uh, the thermal came out with the analyzers in the 70s. Um, however, this stainless steel can become contaminated, can become dirty, right? Uh, and therefore, there's a sufficiency so that needs to be tested as well. Um, a little story on that, we'll kind of take a little tangent here for a minute. We have, this is a sales pitch here, uh, at Cisco, a training system. It's a fully functional single sample point knock CO2 synthesis that we train our field service technicians on. And it's also available for clients if they want to come in and receive some training on it. Okay. Um, just as a point, that shelter is 22 years old. We built it back in 1999, shipped it to a site in Texas. Uh, they replaced it, I think, around. 2017 with the new shelter. We brought this back. So the shelter is old, but the system inside is pretty brand new. You can see we have a fully automated linearity audit soldier rack on it. We even built our whole little stack and put up on it and whatnot. So uh, it's it's a like a functional system. But anyway, the only difference in there is that we have two sets of analyzers. We have a set of thermal analyzers and a set of tapping analyzers. So if we're training on thermal, we turn the valve and run the sample with the ones in thermal analyzers. And conversely, we're teaching on tapping analyzers and we work on tapping analyzers. But anyway, we have that thermal um, NOx analyzer in there and uh, we put a converter efficiency tester in the rack ran a converter efficiency test around that thermal analyzer and it was coming in at 88%. And that's a fail. So not knowing for sure whether it was our tester or the analyzer, Ray changed the converter out of the analyzer. Bingo, they were right up there at 96, 97% efficiency out of the new converter. So Ray called Thermal and said, can we clean this? Converter. And Thermal said, no. no. <laughs> well, that wasn't good enough for Ray. So Ray went ahead and cleaned it. How did you clean it? Uh, uh, first, they ate the, the acid that we used to make to build the ammonia scrubbers. We filled that uh, converter with acid and left it for 24 hours, drained that, and then we hooked the uh, converter up to to power and basically put water in it when it was hot. So that makes a big steam, like steam tea kettle thing, and it, it purged a lot of the, the gunk out of the analyzer. And then we used compressed air to dry to, to dry it out. And we you put it back in and the efficiency came back. Now why that particular converter had that situation because that analyzer hasn't had a lot of hours of operation. So maybe some of the things that we have done testing wise caused it to become dirty. But we also blown out those analyzers on an emergency basis to customers who don't have a spare and have had an analyzer crash. So where it's been, what application it's been on, we don't really have a history on it. But suffice to say, Yes, the stainless steel capability can be rejuvenated and be cleaned, okay? But still has to be tested in order to know that it needs to be cleaned, all right? But I just want to kind of let people know that we do have the ability to, to train uh, 
on that as well. And we can use that also in our various other key efforts and sessions. Okay. Uh, back to white test efficiency. Anyway, the manufacturers tend to give a man an However, there are some regulations that require periodical testing. Do we have anybody here from New Jersey? You do it on every three months, every every quarterly CGA, right? Okay. Um, there's a couple of accepted methods to do the water efficiency test. Uh, one is to use a cylinder bit or two gas. That's a relatively non stable gas. So you are always questioning whether it's really the efficiency or the cylinder gas that you're, you're questioning. The other is to use a 10 bar bag and fill it up with you know, gas and watch it to change over time. But both of them are time consuming. So this is why we come up with our little package, okay? The regulations of 40 CFR 60, right down the road here, and they say that does it, that 70, H, I'm not sure, I really don't know all of that. When you get right down to paragraph 824, the converter efficiency test, and then paragraph 8242 is an alternative to use a procedure in paragraph 16.2. And 16.2.1 says use procedure in 40 CFR 86. 40 CFR 86 is mobile emissions. In my previous life, we had motors and I did a mission lab. Those were the regulations we did. And we ran this constant converter efficiency test every 30 days on every analyzer and every test batch. So that's how we come up with it's okay as far as regulations go. It's acceptable. Okay? But it does require a piece of equipment. Okay? That's what we've developed over there. Um, by the way, this is informal. You guys got a question. Don't wait till the end of the hour to stop and get an answer. Anyway, we have two models that we have developed. We have the manual model, the model 3910, numbered it. It's portable, that's what's sitting on the bench right there. It can be used on multiple systems. Um, and the technician does again to the report. It's all the same, okay? So if you've got six or seven systems, you buy one of these and just put it on the system. We have a second model, which is the auto model, 2920, which is built right into the system. It's under PLC control. And once it's set up, you walk in, push a button on the OIT, the user's interface, and it runs through the test. It generates a report. The senior does that for you, just like it does for the linearities and your CGAs. So, for the New Jersey people, that will cut down a lot of time and effort if that's installed, all right? Um, so anyway, that's the two models that we have. Uh, Auto Model 2920 is installed in that training shop. Yes, sir? Uh, the, on the first one, the versus technician reader report, they can, the seer also has the option they will manually type all that data into the seer. Be stored in there and uh, we'll get the nice pretty report on that. Oh, one. that's great. I didn't know that. Thank you. That's our software group on top of it. <laughs> no, I didn't even know that. Okay. So we have that ability. We got CDR software at your site. Okay. Uh, and there's a picture of it. It's a very simple device. What was challenging was coming up with there are other devices on the market that have very fancy ozonate generators in it, and you're going to pay for it. Uh, way overkill for our application and our need. Uh, 
So got to be, like I say, it's like something that's going to meet what we need, but doesn't overthrow things. So the required connections on it is, of course, you need power to run your 20 volts uh, to run it. Uh, and you got three gas connections. You got two inputs. One is in you know, nitrogen, one is in certain air, and then, of course, the output to the analyzer panel. Now, what we anticipate you do is you use the span cylinder the range that you're going to be using on the analyzer that you're going to be testing. Okay, that's one of the big problems with using a cylinder bit of two. If you're going to follow the regulations, I think they want 40 ppm cylinder bit of two or something. You can do it something like that. Okay. Well, 40 ppm of NO2 on today's analyzers and converters, it just blows them up. They just can't handle them. They just don't know what to do with it. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> we we use the NO cylinder that we use for span in the system. And you just route that through it. Okay. So you're being fair to the analyzer. You're testing it on the range in which you're going to be generating your compliance data. Yeah. So there's just a little graph of uh, the uh, inputs and outputs of the CP test. Okay. Um, now, <coughs> you can bring your own cylinder along with you if you want to use that cylinder. I mean, you know, have to use a cylinder that's on the shelter or the you know, system at the end. But uh, if you're going to be using this repetitively, it would be nice to kind of do some small modifications to your system so you can easily connect it, run the test, disconnect it, and take it to the next shelf. Okay. So for dry instrument here, we just tap off downstream the air dryer, um, use a TV and then cap it. Okay, so that you can run a piece of telephone hose over to pick it up. The NO spin gas the same way, except that that's a three-way valve because you want to reroute the you know, span gas from the chrome, if you will, system into the analyzer or into the uh, tester. And then the output is another three way valve. So that the, the analyzer can have a choice between getting its sample from the tester or from the system. Um, kind of, uh, you can see the uh, There's one on the clicker That's too. The, the three-way valve that would reroute your NO span gas from the system up to the CE tester. There's just a T with an off valve here, and that can be downstream of the pressure regulator if you want the buff stream. And then of course there's this valve here that routes the uh, sample from the tester into the uh, nano tank. So the modifications to a system that you wanted to use it on a continuing basis is pretty simple. Okay. Um, inside that black box there from a plumbing point of view is relatively you simple. Know, you bring in you know, you bring in air. Air is run through the ozonator lamp. The ozonator lamp is off, out comes air. If the ozonator lamp is on, out comes ozone. And it goes to a mixing tea. Um, the mixing tea then, uh, your, your NO is created into NO2 because of the ozone, and it is off to the uh, end. So there's some <clears throat> analyzer setup which will make your life a lot easier if you're uh, going to run this test here. Um, normally in a SIM system, the analyzer is set in an ox mode for your brain body. You know. However, your thermos, your cavities have got the ability to go to the NOx in a mode and it automatically switches back and forth between the two modes. 
How do you know the amount of production that you produce? Good question. Um, you will be able to see that <laughs> when we get to, to the chart. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, this ozone layer that we're typically using right now um, on a nine part per million NO cylinder of gas, we can get about eight ppm of NO2 out of it. We might be able on a higher concentration of cylinder of gas get more out of it. But it's more than enough to test a, a 10 part per million full scale range analyzer. Okay? In fact, we have to be a little careful that we don't leave it on too long. It will just drive it all the way down to zero. We won't have any, and that's not per regulations. Okay, we'll see that here. Uh, so, anyway, you put the analyzer in <clears throat> the NOx and the NO mode. Uh, then we need to input and check the range and span values of both the NO channel and the NOx channel. That's not something that we typically do in a SID system because you run NOx, you span NOx, you set up the NOx, uh, you read the, the NOx off the cylinder and you input that here. If you're going to use the uh, converted efficiency tester, you need to set up both channels and span both channels, make sure that the ranges are in there and uh, the values are, are there. So once that's done, it's done. You don't have to do that every test unless you change the cylinder and you have to change the NO value as well as the NOx value that's in your computer. Uh, on the tap the analyzers, they have a converted efficiency coefficient in them. And be careful to make sure that's set to one so that your test is valid, meaning that it's not going to try to correct on you before you a valid reading off of the test. I don't believe that's in the thermal analyzers. It's the cabin. Um, germ span in both the NO and the NOx channels. That's not critical. You don't have to be absolute on it, just so that you're not failing the zero of the span on the analyzer. Because the test is a relative test. You start here, you go here, and you come back up here. And the efficiency is just how good you come back up. Okay. So uh, don't worry about being absolute and correct on that. I'll tell you a little funny story on that. Um, 40 CFR 86 has a requirement in it that the NO2 content in the cylinder be less than 5% of the NO. Okay. Which back in the days when 40 CFR 86 was made, that was a big concern. I mean, you're talking a thousand part per million cylinders of NO. Okay. okay. Uh, in today's world, it's a ridiculous word. We don't worry about it. But anyway, we could uh, verify that and include it in the report so that the report does meet 40 CFR 86 requirements. We were calculating off the value of the analyzer. For the cylinder we have on our training system right there, there's 0.02 ppm of NO2 in the cylinder. And we were coming up with negative efficiencies just due to the noise of the analyzer and the Cal error in the analyzers. Okay. So we had to back up our software and say, okay, we're going to calculate the efficiency of the values on the cylinder, not off reading off the analyzer, because the analyzers are not that accurate that you can figure out the value of 2 ppm. Okay. So, zero and span, yes, but it is not real critical. And a suggestion you would set your read times to five seconds. Most SIM systems, their read times are set on 10 seconds. You're not really interested in fast responses. But it'll slow you, it, you'll speed it up a little bit. Uh, in our training center there on the model 2020 auto, we can run the test in about 10 minutes. And that's got seven steps, whereas the manual doesn't have that. 
And then, don't forget, you sure have the knocks on the future done with the tips. Those are just push buttons. I don't know how to the analyzers. So, um, anyway, here's the chart. And um, there are, like I see, for the 2910, you've got uh, six steps. The first one is just to connect and activate it. Now, there is a power on off switch in the back, so be, be aware of that. Zero the analyzer. Then you span the analyzer on your Calgas. All right. Now keep in mind you're in the NO NOX mode, so you can see both the NO and the NOX value on the front of the analyzer. And you add a little bit of dilution air on step four. Now these steps are a selector switch, which you can see right there. You can just rotate the switch through the steps. All right. So when you get to step four, you've now blended a little bit of air in with your NO gas. And you get about 90% of your step two. I hope it step two. Oh, I guess it was step two. Yeah, 90% of step three, all right? And then in position five, you turn the ozonator on and you start generating ozone, which creates NO2. And you'll see your NO value drop down. Now your NOx value should stay about the same. And those are values that you record, the A, B, C, D values. And you drive your uh, NO value down to about 20% now. Um, 15% is fine. You don't want to go below 10%. That's the limit in 20 CFR 86 regulations. Okay. And I have added a step six here, which is position five, which is not in the 20 CFR 86 regulations. But your ozone lamp can create some NO, NO2 from the nitrogen in the air. Okay. You know, typically that's less than 0.05 ppm. But when we're working in a 10 part per million range, just like we are working with in today's sense, uh, uh, that 10 of a part per million can be very important in your calculations and efficiency. So if you want to be 40 CFR 86, 100% compliant, you can skip step six. Step six just adds a little bit of correction to the calculation. And then there's the calculations that you put in the values there. And you know, like you can understand what you can say. So again, we're basically comparing this and this. And the NO is up here, the NO is down here, and the NOx should stay right about there. Okay? Makes sense? You're good. You're good. Do you, do you still have slides? There's a worksheet that we've made up that you can fill out the comments on the worksheet. And then, like I said, put it into CDAR as everything is suggested. Or we also have a form that you can put the numbers on that form and sign it and keep it as your record that you can come and test. And it has all the information as to the date, the plant date, the year, the uh, analyzer, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some limitations on the 2910 as well. I have only tested it on the vacuum analyzers. You know what I mean by vacuum analyzers? We pass the sample by the analyzer, the analyzer has a little pump inside of it and it sucks the sample off the manifold. A pressure analyzer, you can drive the sample right into the analyzer. Okay? <coughs> Those are older type analyzers. I have not tested it on that. It might work. Okay. In a California analytical uh, NOx analyzer, for instance, is a pressure one. 
Um, I just haven't tried it. Um, and the end of two creation, which we were questioning here earlier. Um, this device is excellent for a 10 ppm full <coughs> because, like I say, it can pretty much eliminate your entire NO make it an NO2. Uh, I believe it could be stretched to a 20 ppm full scale range as well. Um, in today's industry, it can convert 8, 9, 10 ppm of NO2, you can convert the NO2 that's coming out of your process, right? Um, in the old days, we used to say, well, 5% is NO2 and 95% is NO, but in today's downstream of these SCRs, um, we've seen as high as maybe 50. Okay. But still, 50 50, you get a 2 ppm limit on your plant. That's 1 ppm of NO2 and 1 ppm of NO. And you just tested it and said, I can convert 8 ppm with a 90 plus percent efficiency. You ought to be able to handle 1 ppm, right? Okay, so that's a lot to there, all right? Um, like I say, if you get a bigger scale, a higher scale of the analyzer, you may not be able to drive it all the way down to 20 percent. I haven't tried it, I haven't tested it on that. So, again, I would think that we could run a 20 ppm real easy, a 50 ppm full scale range analyzer. Might be a little bit so, when you get the regular errors to agree to that. Uh, Here's the, the, the second model, the model 2920. Uh, a little simpler, even because the system supports it more than the corner even does. Um, it's rack bound, five and a quarter inches in height. It's plumbed and wired directly into the system. It's, part of the system. it's PLC controlled. Uh, the set times are operator input. You need to set it up once, or we set it up once. <coughs> Unless you do a big modification of the plumbing system, et cetera, that are going to change. <coughs> um, so you have an OIT or the C the real new time interface, you got one input, push a button, and say start the test, just like you do for your audit test. Um, and then see how it generates the report. Um, the additional system requirements when we build them system with this in in order we were to go out and modify an existing system on it. Uh, we have to add two, three-way solar valves. Great. Uh, we need five relay outputs on the PLC. And we need one analog input channel. And that's the end of the analyzer which we don't typically wire in. Um, and again, there is our uh, plumbing diagram for for uh, our training system. There, there's that three-way soloing valve that we had. Uh, we route the NO spam gas into the efficiency tester, and there's a three-way valve that routes it back out. And then we also supply air. So, those would be the plumbing modifications in a system to install the 2920. And again, internal plumbing is even simpler than the manual model because two solar valves are located outside in the system. And again, it's the same, same function. You can bring air and NO in. Turn the ozone generator on, you will pay your mixing T and uh, generate your NO2 uh, supply to your converter for its test. It has a little longer test procedure on it, um, seven steps in here. We record or look at both the uh, NO and the NO expand. And again, that was because we were going to calculate the you know, two percent component in the cylinder off the readings on the analyzer, which didn't turn out to be so successful. 
Okay. So we could actually skip, skip these first two steps here, really, uh, other than the fact that they do verify the fact that the update analyzer has been calibrated prior to your running the test. So that's not bad information to have. Okay. Uh, again, uh, we're in the NOx mode here and in the NO mode there. Um, and that's controlled by the PLC. So again, you don't have to do it with an analyzer setup. Um, step three then, we look at the NO reading as it's been diluted because the dilution air is on. <clears throat> and we bring that C down to about 90% of step two, all right? And we turn the ozonator on and we bring that down here to between 10 and 20%, okay? I'm gonna talk about that here in a minute. And then we go back to the NOx mode. And we're back up here and we read the NOx reading on the analyzer. And really, with all this fancy calculation over here, we're really looking for A and B as close to C as possible. A and C that are percent efficiency. So the calculation is the same on the um, auto model as it is on the, the manual model. Okay. Um, there's the CR report. Just let a few little bugs that Brian and I are working out on it. But, um, we're getting there. Okay. CR will generate that, that report for you and all the information on it that you need to verify that you run an efficiency test. Uh, and there are some limitations on the 2920 as well. Uh, currently, I'm the only been able to test it and work on the thermal 22 NOx analyzers only because the thermal allows us to do a remote remote control. You know, so that other previous we went from the you NO know, to the NOx mode. You know, mode. That was PLC control. You know, they have to the machine buttons on the analyzer. Once you start to test, you can walk off and have a cup of coffee. Back in about two minutes. Uh, the T series CAPI analyzers don't have that function. We requested it and asked for it and begged for it and told them we needed it. And we get the nod. That's all the primary jokes. Now, CAPI is coming out with the new N series analyzers. We haven't got any yet. Oh, okay. They have told us in a uh, conference a year ago when they said, what is it that you need to want in the NOx analyzer? Bob and I said, we need this. And they said, okay. And supposedly, Bob, you had some conversation with them here recently that they said is still under yep. our consideration. Our contact says he's looking into it. Looking into it. <laughs> he asked a question about it. Yeah. So anyway, at this point in time, if you have CAPI analyzers, we really can't make the auto converter efficiency test work because we can't control the phone. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe someday they'll do a little firmware update for us. They got the capability, they got the inputs. All they gotta do is do a little firmware programming to get it done. But so far they're not doing anything. So again, the end series maybe we'll have it. Um, and again, the NO2 creation is the same for this. Can you be arranged in the test? These steps here are programmable in time. You have an input that you uh, check for stability on the analyzer, type in uh, all seven steps in our training center take about 10 minutes to walk through. Okay? That is, except for step 
4. Okay? Um, we have logic in the PLC that says look for this value, and we'll get down to about 15% of this value here. Then we shut the step off. And the PLC will automatically set the right time for you. If you go too long, you'll get down below 10%. If you don't go long enough, you won't get down to 20%. Okay? So, uh, although you can't overwrite that, you can put a specific time in if you want, but if you set that input to zero as far as the uh, setting goes, then the PLC can take over control of the time of step number four. Okay? So that you're going to get that 15% plus or minus 40. Uh, and again, this is a procedure clarification that applies to both models. Those of you who are reading the report CFR 6, we've added that final step to the procedure to get the NOx value on air with the Xavier lamp on. And you're going to come up with about 0.5. It's going to be less than 0.1. Each lamp is a little different as the characteristics and whatnot. And it's just a fine tuned calculation a little more accurate. Okay. So we've added this variable in the CD calculation <clears throat> to compensate for the O2 created by the ozone lamp from nitrogen in the air. Questions? I'm gonna do that in time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, um, like I say, we have tough you, you mentioned New Jersey requires doing that quarterly. Isn't there one of the, doesn't CFR require it annually, 75 or 60? To, I mean, I think we do this, I think our test fitters do it as part of RAD. But I don't most, know how they do it. Most test teams have got to do a pre and a post okay. efficiency test. Then they're allowed to correct their numbers by the efficiency. Yeah, the testers do. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know of any SIMS regulations. I know California that tried to push what San Diego into doing it on a quarterly basis. They kind of resisted it, but it's written right in the 2005 manual at the New Jersey, right? Yeah. So that there, New Jersey, is where we get most of the feedback on. The issues that they have with cylinders trying to, to to come up with the ninety percent passing on on a regular basis, and it's a challenge in using the cylinder method. Some of the the people that do testing for them use the head bar bag method, which again uh, they generally are able to get to the ninety percent, maybe a little bit. But that takes patience. <laughs> but the cylinders. Totally unreliable, they really are. But when you have one and you first buy it, you're, you're probably in pretty good shape. Six months later, you run the test and it's lost probably five, ten percent of that concentration. We have a, a cylinder bit of two and it really uses it as a comparing basis. You'll run it on a brand new analyzer to see what it comes up with, and then you run it on the analyzer to be fixed to repair and check to see how it compares. That's the only feeling good that you have of that cylinder. It's not absolute. But you introduce an error using the cylinder over and over, and that that cylinder has to dry up. And yeah. Right. The over time, it will stratify where it does. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was just wondering why these the regulations have not gone through. Why the regulations? Yeah, are there any other methods to be on Knox? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, your is pretty much in the NDIR or the, um, yes, so the correlation you read. And it'll use an external uh, NO2 to NO converter, which, which are made. Yeah, chemical luminescence is the US. 
basis, okay? Um, uh, when I started in this business, we didn't have people to do this at Santa That's uh, how much senior the title is, okay? Wish 50 years now, okay? Um, the chemical luminescence Knox technology was developed by the four emission labs up in the United Michigan. And after they developed it, they had bought a high voltage transformer to generate a arc to create ozone to make the analyzer work from a little outfit in Massachusetts called the Thermal Electron Corp. And they decided that they were in the business of building automobiles, not analyzers, so they sold the patent rights to the Thermal Electron. That's how they got into the analyzer business, building chemical analysis analyzers. This was in the middle 70s. We got the class of chemical analysis analyzers about 75. In the automotive industry, for a little bit using that thing. And they have really been the US standard since then. But prior to that, we ran an NDIR back with an analyzer NO and then the UV analyzer for the NO2, and then we summed the two readings together and came up with knots. Okay, but that took two analyzers to do that. And uh, UV analyzers are not that popular anymore, okay. primarily because most UV uh, lamps don't last very long. Continuing repair problem with UV analyzers. But yeah, like I say Europe still uses IR. Still uses it already. Problem with that is that um, in a chemical luminescence analyzer, you may flow one liter per minute of sample into the analyzer, but what goes into the reaction chamber can be detected is. 60 cc's, 50 cc's, something like that, if that much, okay? So that's all that's being run through this little you know, NO2 to NO converter. When you put a NO2 to NO converter outside an analyzer, and you run one liter per minute to the analyzer, you're running one liter per minute to the NO2 to NO converter, and therefore you're going to heat the catalyst up a lot faster. Or the same steam you're going to have to really keep it hot in order to have enough residence time in it to do the conversion. So, chemical luminescence is the is the route to go for NOx. Any other questions? So we'll put some of this information out on the website, and uh, so you can take a look at it. But it's, I've got uh, some flyers up here. Yeah. You're welcome to help yeah. yourself to a flyer. Um, Shane created that for us. You also, yeah. Have we come up with any pricing for these options? Uh, yeah, I have. But this is published everywhere, so we'll be that quiet right now. <laughs> <laughs> we have to take any all this. Stuff. The accounts of developing, but it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. So, so will that be part of the certifying? Uh, uh, we'll definitely plan on adding it into our systems as we move forward. It'll be um, an option just like our automated linearity right. is. And it's like, I don't have to see a plan. So, that be start with the case? Right, you would start, you would do your efficiency testing with that and that would qualify for your certification. Yeah. That's the goal, that's the idea. Rather than having the Tumblr bags and the other uh, bottles that uh, are a little questionable at best, uh, we have this option. So it's, that's one of the reasons that so I got excited about it because we used it many years ago and then developed it, could build it, and tinker with things quite a bit. So. I think we have a connection with the Right, right. Yeah, I, the analyzer manufacturers are funny that way. They like to make money. <laughs>